The next thing I heard was You know, she entered first. Guess what I saw? In America, where getting there cost you one dollar to heaven. Guess what I saw? viewers greetings to you welcome to this uh, series of my journey and I'm just going to share with you certain things that um, or certain experiences I am um, you know to, I'll share certain experiences with you also how I became a pilot and we're going to look at so many if I say timelines when I left the shores of Ghana we'll look at that part of it and uh, when I arrived in America what did I see? What did I hear? We are comparing. And uh, my journey from the airport to my final home. You know, what happened? So many things happened. Was it the America I thought of? Or was I dreaming? You know, then we're going to look at things like, I have settled. What next? Then the first day in school. What was I expecting to see? What was I expecting to hear? Did I really understand the slangs that people were speaking by, by the instructors and everybody were, if you say speaking, coming to America for the first time in my life? You know, I'm a bit used to the British accent, but the American one, it took me a long time, especially with their terminologies and everything. Did I really, really, really get what they were saying when they were saying all those kind of things? And we're going to look at things like first day in the classroom, the first flight, my first solo, we're going to look at what is solo. I'll share all these experiences in other videos. Okay, so the journey. How did I perceive aviation? And uh, along the line, as I was going or uh, developing my interest or in developing the career, what did I see? Was it what I expected? Especially American factor, that American factor. America factor in those days, trust me, uh, it was just like, a dollar and a step to heaven okay when I got there did it really cost me a dollar and a step to heaven did I really get into heaven when I got there all these things we are going to talk about it when I got there what happened okay so we'll start off with uh, I will zoom or slow myself straight to the journey to America on this day Wednesday 6th September 1995 I left the shores of UK because I spent some time with my family on my way to America. I spent some time with my family in UK and I left that Wednesday morning through Gatwick Airport and everything was America. Trust me. Bear in mind, in those days, we didn't have any YouTube, WhatsApp, uh, Instagram and stuff to know what's going on in, on the other side of the world. All you, you knew about America was what you saw in the movies. All James Bond, Chuck Norris in our times. Gabby Hayes and all them lovely singers. So America was like in those days a place where when you arrive it just costs you one dollar to heaven. So the question is when I was leaving the shores of UK you can imagine through Gatwick Airport I took a train from my home to um, Gatwick Airport from East Croydon and um, the flight was full of excitement because we thought apart from the fact that we are going to we are going to pursue our career we were also going to the land which you know it just cost you one dollar to heaven from the things which we had seen in the hollywood movies and trust me i also wanted to look Ghanaian when i went there so uh, you see it on the pictures will be flowing on the screen and you see when i was also in my northern territory smoke as we say the nt smoke and i wanted to look like a Ghanaian who had just arrived in america so we departed gatwick about let's say 10 o'clock in the morning uk time 6 september 1995 and um, after an eight-hour flight obviously time difference and everything we're supposed to have arrived in uh, our first port of call was New Jersey as they call it Newark Airport Newark okay and that was our first point of call so we arrived in Newark and um, obviously it was five hours behind so instead of it uh, reading like six o'clock in the evening I mean London time we are now we arrived about one o'clock so there was a two-hour transit 
and I wanted to kind of start Americanizing myself from Newark Airport because I had to uh, transit another two hours. Sorry, I had to wait two hours at Newark Airport to take another flight to Orlando, Florida. Okay, so what was the excitement? As soon as I got there, I wanted to feel like what I used to see in the movies. Can you imagine? So I went straight to Burger King and got myself the first meal in America, 6 this September 1995. And I did so much justice to the burger and a milkshake. And I just went into one of the shops, bought myself a magazine, they have anything about flight magazines, and I just started to read it as I was waiting for my flights. Trust me, so after I grabbed the burgers and did good justice to the burgers and milkshake, I remember strawberry milkshake, then I felt Americanized that I have arrived. You know, you know, you had this feeling that you're not going to go back again. But for me, because of my passion of my career, I really wanted to go back after training. But I thought these were the good introductions to uh, America. So I'm just talking about the American factor. What I was expecting to know, because I've been, I'd, I'd known UK already. And if they say there was somewhere it was supposed to be better than UK, of course, everybody wanted to see it. And like I told you, in our days, the only way you could know America was through the Hollywood movies. So we got there, waited two hours in transit, then the flight connecting from Newark to Orlando International, Florida, uh, was ready to board, full of excitement. And it was going to be the aircraft that I was going to fly when I get back home after training called the DC-9. In our days, those were also our modern jets for those days. Are you okay? Very excited, you know. And I began to get some warning signs, something I'll call the warning flags. Remember, all those of you who know the American territory, September is uh, not a nice weather time in, um, in fact, any part of the eastern to the southern side of America, especially Florida. They had just gotten out of Hurricane Andrew, which was unbeknownst to me because I didn't even know what a hurricane felt like until I started, I started studying meteorology. So you can imagine a whole state that had gotten out of a devastating hurricane called Andrew. Still, that was August. That was the month before I went. So we still had that remnants, and America under the meteorological belt was still under the rainy season, and they had their. So the flight in between about, let's say, the last 40 minutes to touch down in Orlando, let's say, the, it was a two and a half hour flight. So let's say maybe the last 50 minutes, we got into my first experience in getting into a thunderstorm. Oh my God, as a passenger. Man, it wasn't funny because one, I was not a pilot. I didn't understand the dangers and I didn't understand anything. All I could see was we just bouncing up and coming down, everything bouncing up, and I could literally feel the beggars, you know, I mean, getting destroyed. I could literally feel the beggars and the milkshake just, you know, all the American stuff was now beginning to get out of me. I was like, whoa, what am I doing here? We went for a good 30 minute shake, okay, before we, you know, that's also another video for another time, the details of it, you know, when you get into a thunderstorm, how it's felt at the back ends. I'll give you certain tips that you can do, which I didn't know then because I was not a pilot. So we didn't know how to react in turbulence on how to tighten the lower abdomen and everything. We didn't know all this stuff. All we knew, we had gotten into bad weather and everyone was screaming here and there. But, well, it was like, okay, maybe. It was scary though because, like I said, we didn't know what even weather was to start with. Then we all arrived in Orlando another big international airport but the thing is when we got to orlando that will be about six o'clock seven o'clock their time in the evening my uh, my thinking was where i was supposed to go was a place called vero beach i didn't know that it was another three hour drive from orlando i didn't know i just thought oh you get to orlando you just sit in a bus two three stops or Someone was supposed to meet me, supposedly to be my landlady and old lady. And all the times we were communicating, I was communicating with her in the UK. The impression I got was that in the UK mentality, you get to a place like Victoria Station and, you know, maybe you take a fast train here or whoever has come to meet you, we'll just drive about maybe 20 minutes and we are home. So I get into Orlando and the first phone call I make was to the landlady who was supposed to pick me up and said, Oh, oh you are in Orlando. You got to go to Fort Pierce. You got to go to Fort Pierce. I'm like... Trust me, first American accent I'm hearing, you know, in real life, apart from movies, you know. So I didn't even hear what she said. And I just heard all I heard was, Fort Pierce, Fort Pierce, Fort Pierce. So okay, no problem. So I just went to ask around. I also didn't know. I thought here was just like Ghana, you know, you can just call any stranger and say, excuse me, I want to look, I'm looking for here. Remember, no Google Maps, no, uh, uh, what do you call it, pin locations and whatever, nothing. Everything will kind of, you have to look at maps on the, on the wall and everything. So to cut a long story short, I've rather found out that from the Orlando airport to the bus station that's going to do the three-hour drive 
was another 30 minute drive from the Orlando airport after I had gone through um, customs and everything. So I had to pick another taxi. First, my first time in an American taxi, or the first time getting off an airport was the, six, the night of 6 September 1995. You know, and we had to get out into a taxi and drive straight to the, what we call the Greyhound bus station. Uh, those of you who know America, that's their bus transportation system. So we had to go to Greyhound in Orlando. And that one to have another two hour wait for that bus that leaves there for the three hour journey to Fort Pierce. Man, I was so tired. And now, well, but I could still see America, a bit of America, the kind of dream that people were always talking of and it just cost one dollar to heaven. I still saw everything. You understand? Because you, Orlando, if you know Orlando, where Disney World is and the whole city is, you still could see a few buildings here and there, skyscrapers. In fact, remember at that point in time, for those of you who know Ghana very well, the only sort of thing that looked like a skyscraper in this whole country was the Job 600 and the Ghana Commercial Bank building. That was the only thing that could be a semblance of skyscrapers. So you can imagine me going to see the thing almost like thousand in maybe in one spot. You know, so the American stuff was still there, you know, a bit of excitement. But now I began to get tired after jet lag and all these things and, you know, I had to leave this, uh, I, mean, I mean, two hours, so I said, this is what I'm going to do. I looked at a certain uh, corner and saw hot dogs. I said, this is the first time I'm going to take hot dogs in America. You know, because the burgers and all the plane, on the, uh, everything I ate on the plane just dissipated with the weather that we went through. So, this was time that I took two good hot dogs. You know, just to Americanize, still in the, in the American spirit, Americanize myself, feeling that, yes, I've lived here for a thousand years, so I took a hot dog and a big I mean, they are coca colas big bottles. We're not talking about these small two-liter bottles. I mean, I really had a happy night. I just waited for my flight. After the bus was ready to leave for Fort Pierce, and I didn't know one thing about Greyhounds, that every X number of miles, they will have to stop to a, either a Burger King station, a McDonald's. Everybody gets off, and you still have to go and eat and everything. Interesting, interesting stories, trust me. The, the, and from Orlando, America decided to vanish. That was where America decided to vanish. And the shock started to become real. Because the journey to uh, Fort Pierce is not through big cities. You go through remote counties, as they would say in America. Remote counties, uh, countryside, you know. So now America began to vanish. And it's like I was traveling from Cape Coast to Accra in the night. You could see all the bush trees here, bush trees here. And I... I I could literally hear all those night bugs in all these grasses. You know, just like, me, 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 me. I'm like, ah, is this America? Trust me, how we knew of America through Hollywood, trust me, what I was seeing, now the shock was beginning to get real. Are you okay? So after those three hour journeys, stopping here, stopping here, I had an old lady next to me in the bus, and you know, after the first meal in McDonald's, she came, she was snoring and kind of nodding her head, was sleeping on my chest and she was just snoring. Everybody was snoring after a meal in the night and everything. And then I began to see more of a non, let me put this way, a non-American setting, you know, till we got all the way to Fort Pierce. I'm just cutting a long story short. Later I'll, get, I'll tell the details. So we get to Fort Pierce and I see this, I make a, a, I'm in Fort Pierce. And you know, in those days there were no mobile phones, not even in America. So the only thing is that she, she will tell you or whoever is meeting you that when you get to Fort Pierce, maybe stand in front of this part of the station or that part of the station. Otherwise, there was nothing to phone somebody and tell them, here, am I, where are you? And stuff like that. That was in the night. Okay. So this landlady came with her niece and um, they came to meet me. Uh, you know, and finally, when everything was over, I put my luggage in her car. Then I realized that I had to go to a place called Vero, I mean, I told like I was going to Vero Beach. But I don't know in the way the Fort Pierce, it bypasses Vero Beach for another 45 minutes. That's for the way from Orlando in the north all the way to going southbound into Fort Pierce. You had to go and bypass wherever I was supposed to sleep because they didn't have a bus station there. You had to go to Fort Pierce. That's drive another 30 something minutes or 45 minutes beyond Vero Beach. So I was so tired. Now we had to drive back up again for another 45 minutes. So you can imagine when I woke up in Streatham, UK. To the time I put my head on the pillow, um, you know, in Vero Beach, finally, Vero Beach, Florida, after all these torturous rides going through aeroplanes, cars, train. In fact, that day, apart from a ship, 
I took every mode of transport. Can you imagine? Every mode of transport apart from a ship. Because I took a train from Shretham, East Coiding to Gatwick Airport, a fast train, an aircraft, then you transit an aircraft, then you came on ground, a taxi, then from a taxi to a bus, and a bus to a private car. I went through every mode of transport. And finally, uh, got to, uh, we had this drive to, uh, from Fort Pierce back up north to Vero Beach. What were the other shocks? My landlady looked like some aunties I had in Ghana and, you know, some teachers who I also knew in primary school. Everything was, she was a black American, though, with her niece, who also looked like one student I may know somewhere in one of these schools and everything. You know, I mean, not America vanished because Fort Pierce was also a little county. It didn't really have much skyscrapers, but, you know, that whole thing that we used to see in movies, New York City, Texas, Hollywood, all those things we used to see now began to kind of dissipate. The, the, the more I did these journeys. And I was coming back into Vero Beach, which is also a retirement community. The flight school was at Vero Beach, all right. They had nice golf courses and everything, but the whole area is generally where for retired um, you know, people living there, just you know, enjoying pension. So you didn't see much of the skyscraper stuff, trains crisscrossing over overhead bridges and that kind of things you see in busy cities. So then I began to get a little bit of depression. Like, mm, where am I going? You know, is this for real? Is this the flight safety? Did I miss my journey and everything? You know, along the car, I mean, as we were going from Vero Beach, sorry, from Fort Pierce bus station to Vero Beach, my home, my landlady was trying to engage in conversation. Obviously, it's natural. She's met me for the first time. Every time, phone calls and letters, and now she's seen me and, you know, engaging each other. And there was one thing I saw in America that gave me a second shock. Apart from now seeing the, not seeing skyscrapers and everything, so anytime they engage and she wants to laugh, then she was driving and she just said, oh, is that so? <laughs> I'm like, America, America, trust me. Today, you guys know the difference. So much YouTube videos on everything anywhere in the world. But in our time, you can imagine, not on TVs. Everything you see was movies. And, you know, to see and somebody who hasn't been to Africa before, behaving more than an african that was another shock remember i was very young to absorb all these shocks and once in a while the niece who was in fact the niece who was driving because she was old and she couldn't really see so the niece was driving so she was just there in the front and always laughing along <laughs> you know stuff like that and every time we're making this journey home you know the niece also chipping the niece also start laughing but the, it was like i was sitting in a, a car in ghana can you imagine i'm like ah why did this excitement vanish to because at newark airport before transiting to orlando yes everything was just like you saw it in the movies but the more south i went to my abode you know the more i saw more uh, africa more than america then eventually we turned into the main street that leads into our neighborhood and the bungalows were just like the bungalows you see at Legon. I'm not saying Legon is bad, but the universities. That was a campus. So, you know, those open bungalows. I was supposed to see the house, like, you know, in the UK. And some of these busy cities, you know, you park in front. Everybody parks his car outside the house. And you. And I was supposed, I was supposed to see something of, of, of that nature. But it was like entering you know, any of these houses, like when you go to the campuses on our universities and everything. So I got down, looked around. Nothing America. You know, because that was about, trust me, that was, by that time it was 11 p.m. getting to midnight. You know, so I was like, ah, I'm looking for that America. I was expecting to see music here, you know, a bit of pubs here, you know, whatever we see in the movies, whatever they make us to believe in the movies, you know. But it was just a quiet night in the neighborhood where everybody was minding their beer for 11 p.m. Nobody was there. And the final shocker before, you know, entering my room was, uh, as we were taking the staff, we were taking the staff, my niece, I mean, her niece, was uh, just carrying a bit of um, some things I had bought, uh, you know, from uh, for them, like you know, kind of uh, souvenir stuff. And the next thing I heard was, you know, she entered first. Guess what I saw in America, where getting there cost you one dollar to heaven. Guess what I saw? Trap door for mosquitoes. Oh my God! In Florida. Things that we've heard about Florida in our days was something to do with the Space Shuttle Center, Orlando, Miami. That was the only thing we knew about Florida. We never knew there was a neighborhood for this because all the movies we saw was, if you remember those of us who were who are over, over 14, and there was a film called Miami Vice, you know, and they showed the real downtown Miami. 
Then there was something about Orlando plus Disney World. So you can imagine these are things I was expecting to see. Trap door in Florida. I'm like, obviously there should be mosquitoes in Florida. And lo and behold, guess what the next thing I saw? Yes, there were mosquitoes. The only advantage, the only, the, the only lack was that, that, that the mosquitoes there just sting you and give you the pain, but not malaria. They don't give you malaria. If they were to give malaria, trust me, there would be no human being because the mosquitoes were big, twice as what I, I, I know from Ghana. You know, mosquitoes looking like oranges, almost like oranges in Florida. That's even the whole thing that, because trust me, anybody who was born around my time knows that everything that we see on the movies was anything between Orlando and Miami. Nobody knew that we had a place called Jacksonville. Nobody knew we had a place called Vero Beach, which is a kind of retirement community. All we saw was, you know, all we know about Florida is the Kennedy Space Shuttle Center and uh, Orlando Disney World and also in Miami, everything that we need to know about Miami. Those were the hot places, the hot beds in that state in Florida. And I drive and I'm being met by people who look like my relatives. I'm not saying my relatives are bad. They look like my relatives. They look Africans. But they, hadn't even, they didn't even know where Ghana was. They hadn't even been out. Some of them had not been, their niece had not even been out of the state of Florida before. You understand? So she's just, they all, you know, this, when you get into these neighborhoods, I mean, these communities, you see, some people don't even have a passport. Because you just say, ah, where am I going? I have nowhere to go. You know, but what, what I was expecting to see was uh, something like London. When you were in London, those of you know London a bit of Brixton or maybe Croydon. You expect to see things that like the nightlife is just hot and bustling like New York, like Manhattan. It was that kind of Manhattan, you know, thing I was expecting to see. But I just drive into a neighborhood that looks like any of our neighborhoods here. And trapdoor, mosquitoes, Florida. Hey, question. Did I, do I still want to be here? So after I put my stuff, she showed me the room. Yeah, it was cozy. For that one, I give it to every home in America. The rooms were cozy. They showed me where I was supposed to sleep and everything. Then we had to, we went into another conversation because we kept, you know, work about Ghana, about schooling. Up to about 1 a.m. before, I just finally said, look, it's about time to just, you know, sleep. So can you imagine this journey? A bit of a mixture of excitement, disappointment, shocks, you know. Remember, trap door in Florida. Mosquitoes in Florida. This is the America that was shown to us in all these Hollywood movies you were seeing, the celebrities who used to live in Beverly Hills and Las Vegas. Those were the kind of America I was supposed to see, but the journey was very interesting. Mixture of good feelings. I know in those days you couldn't just send a text message home that arrived safely or anything. You had to write letters. So I'll tell you the next phase of it. Trying to tell people around the world that not knowing hey, I'm in a part of America, which is not America. So I had to go to a post office the next day, get stamps. That's another story for another day where I went to the post office, got some stamps, and, you know, had to write about 100 letters to my sisters in London, parents, in, I mean, family in Ghana, you know, and all friends everywhere around, around the world that this my America is not really the America yet. That's another story for another day. So that's my journey from Gatwick to Vero Beach. Every mode of transport I took apart from my ship. What happened on my first day in school? Join me on my next video. Captain Victor Moore is my name. Love you all. 6th September 1995 was that day. Peace.